Test, test, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Good morning. Welcome to Trinity United Church of Christ, an open and affirming congregation here in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, that truly tries to put into practice a statement that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. It's a joy to welcome you here in person. It's a joy to welcome you online, even though there is an issue with our online worshipers. Online worshipers you will be able to see the screens, the words on the screens, and you'll be able to hear me and hear what's going on in the worship service. But our camera is not working this morning, so you won't see anybody else. You won't see any other pictures besides what's on the, uh, the screens. So I just wanted to warn all of our online worshipers um, about that. Um, happy Father's Day to all you fathers. Um, reminder that uh, we have carpenter pencils as gifts to all of our fathers who are here worshiping with us. You can sort of look at it as a, 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 a pencil from the carpenter, capital C, i.e. Jesus, to all of uh, uh, the carpenters who are here in the congregation. And um, by the way, if you don't know how to sharpen a carpenter's pencil, let me know. I'll, I'll get my knife out and sharpen it for you since it doesn't fit in a pencil sharpener. Anyhow. Also, happy Juneteenth Day. And no, I'm not making that up. This is the first year that America is celebrating Juneteenth Day as a national holiday. Now, what is Juneteenth? Juneteenth commemorates the day, June 19th, 1865, that 2,000 Union troops arrived in Galveston Bay, Texas, and informed the remaining 250,000 enslaved Americans that the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Abraham Lincoln had granted them freedom. Texas was the first state to make June 19th a state holiday back in 1980, and over the years it has come to be known as Freedom Day, Emancipation Day, Jubilee Day, and Liberation Day. But it's clear from all these names that it celebrates the joy that accompanies finally being free from legal enslavement. The first Juneteenth was observed, observed in 1866, and note this is not a holiday for black Americans, as some would have you think. This is a holiday where all people concerned about equality and justice should look forward to celebrating every year just as much as the 4th of July. So happy Juneteenth Day to everyone. A few other announcements to share with you. 
Um, first of all, a reminder that next Sunday uh, we have our congregational meeting uh, following church. The annual reports are right over here on the table. Please grab a report and read through all the reports at some point this week. We ask that you just take one per family uh, so that we make sure we have enough. Um, let me see. Also, I want to remind everybody of the uh, elder care uh, workshop on Thursday evening. Um, beginning at 6 o'clock. There's a sign-up sheet on the board over here. Please sign your name to it so that we can make sure that we have enough food. We will be providing a, a light meal um, as well. Uh, so uh, sign up on the board uh, if you are interested in coming to our, our we call, we're calling it elder care, but it's, it's estate planning, it's long-term care, um, all kinds of things regard, in regards to growing older more mature. How's that? The Out to Eat group is going out to eat on Friday. This Friday at 6 o'clock we are going to the grill at Runways. That's down in the, at, by the Hagerstown Airport. Um, please uh, let me know or let the office know um, of your desire to go with us. Uh, currently we have reservations for 20. Um, uh, so we can take up to 20 people, or I, I need to call the restaurant and try and get more reservations. But please let us know as soon as possible. You can let me, let me know if you're planning on coming. And of course, on Saturday, it's a busy week. Saturday is our blood drive. Uh, how many do we have, Jay? We have 28 as of uh, Eight. 20 slots We have 20 slots remaining. We have 28 We need blood donors. Yes, please. We need at least 20 more blood donors. So uh, talk to your friends, your family, um, and let's try and get uh, a full slate uh, so that we can get um, as many people as possible donating blood. Uh, I believe those are, oh, uh, the seniors, are the seniors going out to eat on, on Friday as well? Um, or the young at heart, I should say. Uh, Anybody? Yes, they are. Lunchtime, I remember, yeah. Um, I, uh, they're, they're going to China King at lunch on Friday, um, meeting at 11.30, eating at 12. So if you um, are young at heart and want to go out to lunch, um, that is happening on Friday. Busy week, to say the least. If there are no, or, no other announcements, oh, yes, Pat. So that was Pat Fogel. Uh, she is now our ride coordinator for those within our congregation who might need a ride to a doctor's appointment or a hospital visit or something like that. Um, we do need some additional drivers. Uh, if you are willing to drive somebody to an appointment, um, let Pat know or let the uh, church office know. Um, and if you need a ride, you can either call Pat directly or call the church office and we will get you in touch with Pat. So. Um, uh, yes, thanks for reminding me to say that. Anybody else have an announcement? If not, let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
this time, I'd like to invite those of you who are able and willing to stand and join in our responsive call to worship. God is ready for us to seek what is eternal. God wants us to find the truth beyond ourselves. God seldom comes as earthquake, wind, or fire. Rather, in moments of sheer silence, God is revealed. All are welcome here as brothers and sisters in Christ. Here is a place to find healing promise. Let us join our hearts and our minds together in our prayer of invocation. Let us pray together. God, our refuge and our hope, come among us today to give us energy and purpose. Move us beyond the discipline of the law to the discipleship of faith. Free us from the shackles of fear and a sense of failure that keep us from stepping bravely into your future. Grant us the sense that we are not alone, but are part of a great company of your faithful people of every nation and tongue. Amen. When we ask to be delivered from deceitful and unjust people, we need to first of all look at ourselves, to examine ourselves to see if we are completely honest and just. When we sense demonic forces in our world, we must ask if there is any evil in us. When we're tempted to exclude, we are met by an inclusive God who calls us to repentance. Let us join our hearts together as we repent to God. Almighty and sovereign God, we confess that we have broken covenant with you, despised some of your children, and accused you of forgetting us. Our lives do not praise you, our actions deny you, and our work is carried out without reference to your will. We draw lines of distinction among ourselves rather than celebrating our common humanity. When we are jealous for our faith, we trample on others rather than learning to know and appreciate them. Oh God, forgive us and change us. Amen. When we want to be helped, God is ready to pardon us and equip us for new life. Wounded spirits are restored to wholeness. Enemies 
can become friends. We can grow in faith and love. God puts a new song on our lips and puts confidence in our hearts. Praise God for the forgiveness we receive through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everybody. There's been an addition to the bulletin this morning. Uh, last week, it was uh, listed that we would be presenting grants, um, and that was moved to this week. And then we forgot to put it in the bulletin for this week. So, ta-da! Here we are. Oh, that's okay. We'll make it go fast, Andrew. Okay. I'm glad the children could make it. The members of Trinity United Church of Christ in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, recognizing the need for higher levels of education and desiring to encourage persons to grow educationally, established an educational fund. The fund is called the Trinity United Church of Christ Educational Fund. Monies from this fund shall be available to young and old alike, individuals or groups desiring to pursue chosen fields of higher education or to grow within the realm of Christian education. Today, the trustees of the Educational Fund continue this tradition of encouraging persons to grow educationally by presenting grants to the following. As I call your name, would you please come to the front? We have a short bio that goes with each person. Kelly Kearney. Kelly Kearney is currently working on receiving her Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology from Shippensburg University. Since Kelly lives with a disability that has caused paralysis on her left-hand side and is currently recovering from a stroke, she would ultimately like to earn her master's in psychology 
and help others by working in a healthcare related field. Zach Kearney, that's, hold your applause. Well, hold your applause to the end. We want to make sure you hear about everybody. <laughs> Zach Kearney. Zach is currently enrolled at Hagerstown Community College, working on his associate's degree in political science. Once he has completed his program at HCC, Zach would like to begin work on his bachelor's degree in political science as well. Zach is currently serving as a caregiver for his mother, Kelly. Teresa Coda. Teresa is completing a master's in social work through an online program from the Columbia School of Social Work. Her family here include her husband, Caleb, and their two daughters, Franny and Esther. Teresa graduated summa cum laude from Wittenberg University with a Bachelor of Arts in English and Religion in 2011. Teresa also earned a Master's in Divinity from Harvard Divinity School in 2014. She served as a chaplain resident at Brigham and Women's Hospital from 2014 to 2015 as well as a per diem on-call chaplain at Women and Infants Hospital from 2015 to 2020. She served as a volunteer hotline counselor for the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center for six years after completing a 40-hour crisis counselor training program. Teresa is currently working remotely as a youth minister and director of faith formation for Our Lady of Sorrows Church, developing and implementing faith formation programming for children through adults, including teaching Sunday school classes, leading retreats, and running groups. She freelance writes for a variety of publications, including U.S. Catholic Magazine, Busted Halo, and Amendo, writing pieces from short blog posts to longer form reported articles, 2018 to present. In 2021, the Family Life column that she co-writes for U.S. Catholic Magazine won the Best Regular Column Award from the Catholic Press Association. She will be completing her final internship this coming school year at Brook Lane Health Services or should be a therapist intern at their North Village outpatient office in Hagerstown. Jillian Austin. She is pursuing her master's in educational psychology through Edinburgh University. Her family at Trinity includes her husband Garrett, her mother and father Deb and Mark Holland, and her mother and father Deb and Mark Holland. She graduated cum laude with bachelor's in science in music education and music from Millersville University. Currently, Jillian teaches at St. Berea Goretti Catholic High School and is a music director at Trinity United Church of Christ. Before a music director position at TUCC, Jillian served as a music director at St. Anne's Roman Catholic Church from 2017 to 2021. Brett Kaufman. Brett is enrolled for his second year at Penn State Monaldo campus with an ultimate goal of earning a master's degree in mechanical engineering. He is the son of Tim and Tammy Kaufman, grandson of Linda and Richard Dahl. Brett has done work as a dishwasher and delivery driver for Cafe Del Sol, as well as landscaping with Joe Klein. Kenneth King. Kenneth will be completing his Bachelor of Arts in International Studies at Shippensburg University. He is the son or stepson of Teresa and Robert Tibbetts. Kenneth is maintaining a Jeep. GPA of 3.5 has been on the Dean's List each year while at Shippensburg. Recently, Kenneth worked at the Martin's Deli for six months, and previous to that, he worked four months on the Shippensburg campus at the Help Center desk in the Student Union Building, as well as an intern for the LGBT Pride Center on campus. Once he completes his Bachelor of Arts, Kenneth would like to work towards a Master's in Social Work with a focus on substance abuse and LGBT issues. Bryce Schaefer. Bryce will be starting his second year at York College of Pennsylvania, where he is currently enrolled in the Civil Engineering Program. Bryce, coming forward now, is the son of Kathy and Scott Schaefer. Bryce plays for the York College baseball team as a first baseman and pitcher. This past year, Bryce a Presidential Awards Scholarship from York College and finished the year with a 3.01 grade point average. He has worked at the South Mountain Golf Course for the past two years and will also be playing Legion Baseball for the summer. Kara Weikert. I don't think Kara is here, but Kara is a two, 
2022 graduate of the Commonwealth Charter Academy. She is slated to start her pursuit of an associate's degree in radiography, radiography at Northampton Community College this fall. She is the daughter of Judy and Terry Reichard, granddaughter of Walter and Catherine Gemby. While in high school, Kira was on the honor roll and participated in field hockey, softball, and basketball through field, Fairfield High School. She was on the Athletes' Edge Travel softball team, was recognized as Gettysburg Times Player of the Week, and was part of the PIAA All-Star Softball Team, 2019, 21, and 22. In addition, Kira has helped with childcare 35 to 40 hours per week and worked part-time as a cashier shelf stalker, whatever needed, at Sanders Market in Cascade, Maryland. Noah Eastman. Noah is starting his Juris Doctor degree from Penn State Law. The JD is a standard degree to practice law. He is a husband of Francesca Yaki. Noah graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor's of Science in Economics from Shippensburg University. While there, he was on the dean's list all semesters of his undergraduate program, was a member of Omicron Delta Epsilon, an academic honor society for the study of economics, and was the recipient of Departmental Student Award from the Shippensburg University Association of Pennsylvania State College and University Faculties. Noah served as an infantryman for the Pennsylvania Army National Guard from August 2015 to August 2021. He is currently working as a regulatory analyst for the Pennsylvania Office of Consumer Advocate in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And our last one is Donovan Yockey. He's a 2022 graduate of Shippensburg Area Senior High School. This fall, he will begin his pursuit of a bachelor's degree in computer science through Duquesne University. He is the son of Donovan and Jennifer Yockey and a grandson of Kay and Ordeen Yockey. While at Shippensburg, Donovan was an honor roll student and earned all A's in his senior year. He was awarded the John Philip Sousa Award for his leadership, dedication, and initiative within his school's music program this year. Donovan has been working at Five Guys since October 4th, 2021. That's it, I think. <laughs> All right, so now let's get some of our younger kidlets up here. Are there any more who would like to come forward? I don't see anybody. Oh, there we go. Oh, stretch. Should we all do a stretch right now? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a good one, Ivan. Oh, you're brilliant. Oh, oh here we come. You told me you weren't going to come up. <laughs> We'll wait, we'll wait. Hey, bud, you got some hair stuff. Oh, we got Kaden. <laughs> yep, there's Mama. Oh, she's barefoot too, I love it. Hey, that's all right. That's how I prefer to be. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Doing okay? Yeah. Well, I wanted to talk to you really quickly this morning. Pastor Bruce already kind of mentioned it. Today's a holiday. Did you know that? It's a holiday, y'all. It's called Juneteenth. That's a strange name. We take the, num the name June and today's date, the 19th, and we go smush, and we get Juneteenth. Isn't that fun? And it is a day where we celebrate specifically the beauty and power of black and brown bodies. I'm looking at you two specifically. Yeah. Because a really long time ago, 
Do you guys know what freedom is? Hmm. That's a weird, that's a hard word. That's a hard word. What do you think free means? Hmm. You don't have to pay for it at the store. Yeah. So what are some things that you just love to do? What do you love to do? Go to the park. Yeah. What are some other things you really like to do? Ivan, mean, what do you like to do? Play at home. Yep. Anyone really like to just eat and eat whatever the heck they want to eat? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, do we like to go outside and just play whenever we feel like it? Yeah. Well, believe it or not, there was a time where not all of us could do those things. All right? Some of our friends who are, have darker skin than us, oh, they weren't allowed to do those things. Isn't that awful? It's terrible. It's absolutely disgusting, right? But on June 19, 1865, the news got down to Texas. The, hey, guess what? We're not letting this happen anymore. Slavery? Mm -mm. We're done. Get out. And there were parties everywhere. There were people celebrating. They were going out to the park when they couldn't do it before. They were going outside and playing like they couldn't before. They were eating whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. They danced. They sang. It was awesome. And for 150 plus years, they've done that every year. And it wasn't until last year that we finally said, you know what? Juneteenth needs to be a for real national holiday. Just last year. How cool is that? It took a while. But how cool is that? And guess what? You guys, you little ones, you are our teachers, all right? And you know what? Isn't that weird? That doesn't sound right. Adults are supposed to know everything, right? That ain't true. <laughs> that ain't true at all, y'all. All right. Uh, well, maybe Andrew does. <laughs> he has secrets in that beautiful hair of his. You guys, you love unconditionally. And it just comes for, it just comes naturally. You are kind because that's just who we are made to be. Because who's that, um, who's that guy we like to talk about in this church a lot? And he talked about love and kindness. Mr. Rogers, yep. Someone before Mr. Rogers. Starts with a J. Daddy. <laughs> oh, happy Father's Day, Caleb. <laughs> Jesus. Because guess what? Oh, wait, yep. Yeah. Jesus said this all the time. For those of you who can read it, it said, or can't, choose love, no exceptions. Because Jesus said, love your neighbor. Did he say, love your neighbor, but not those people over there? Did he say that? Mm -mm. Did he say, love your neighbor, but, you know, if they think a little differently, you probably shouldn't. It's okay to hate them. So your mission as our teachers is to show all of these adults in this room and outside of this hall and outside of this church how to love like you guys do. Because you do it beautifully. You are our best teachers. So that is my mission for all of you to just continue to be you. Be kind, be loving, and be your sweet, goofy selves because the world needs you. We still got some work to do, and I have faith in every single one of you. You're going to lead the way, and you're going to show us how to do it. Think you can do that? Yeah. Just being you. Yeah. So can we do a really quick prayer? All right. Ready? Dear God, thank you for everybody. Thank you. For Jesus, who taught us to choose love, no exceptions. And this is for the adults only. Help us to follow our kidlets. 
We love you. We praise you. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. You can go back to your seats or back to the nursery to your goldfish. I know they're waiting for you, aren't they, Owen? <laughs> he gone. He gone. <laughs> Good morning. Our readings today start with 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 15. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenants, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Our second reading is from Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. <clears throat> then they arrived at the region of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped on shore, a man from the city who had demons in him met him for a long time, excuse me, met him. For a long time he had not worn any clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, shouting, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? He answered, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on this hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter there. Then he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd stampeded down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. 
When the swineherds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had been gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they became frightened. The one seen it told how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. And the whole throng of people of the surrounding region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. That ends our reading for this morning. Thank you. Let us join together in prayer. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of our hearts be upon you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've been pondering how much life can be just too much sometimes. That was the opening sentence of a blog post from back in September, September 1st, 2021, written by Marlo Chileski, founder of a California charitable organization that works with at-risk children. And her post for that day was titled, too much. And Shlesky mentioned some things from the previous week, including some very depressing news on the global level and the surge of the Delta variant of the coronavirus that was then spreading across America and killing people. Things weren't much better in her own community where there was a, a, a fatal shooting or a fatal stabbing, excuse me, a fatal stabbing at a local high school resulting in one 17-year-old dead and 17 and 14-year-olds arrested. Elsewhere in her community there was a double homicide, another attempted homicide, and more, much more. And then on top of that, all Shalesky had to deal with some life-threatening health incidents with two of her own children. It's all too much, Shalesky said. We were not created to bear the burdens of the world. But these days, the 24-7 news makes it possible to know all the heavy, horrible things going on in the world, to add to the burdens of community and family, it's just too much, she said. So I find myself emotionally battered, weary, burdened, exhausted. Do you ever feel that way? I want to say, duh. <laughs> I know I certainly do. And Elijah could relate to those feelings, I feel as well from the Old Testament lesson from 1 Kings. In the big encounter with the prophets of Baal, where he had them all killed, we find Jezebel, who was a worshiper of Baal, and she was not a big Elijah fan, to say the least. She threatened to kill him, so Elijah took off running until he found himself in God's presence God asked him, what are you doing here? And his response was, I'm all alone. And they're even seeking my life. This is what we might call a hard time text. A hard time text. We might have read this story of Elijah before, but it has a way of jumping out at us when our circumstances are similar to those alluded to in the scripture. Casey Sepp, who was a staff writer at The New Yorker, noticed this in her life. She was raised in a Lutheran church. 
She said that Sunday services were her first book club that she ever belonged to. Because week after week, very thoughtful, very loving people gathered around the same book and tried to figure out what exactly it meant. That book, of course, was the Bible. And Sepp grew up steeped in the Bible. And she has continued to read the Bible as an adult. But now, however, something new happens whenever she reads the Bible. It's because of a time when she was reading the Bible while she was pregnant with her first child. She explained this in her essay, Reading the Old Testament While Pregnant, which she had printed in The New Yorker. During her pregnancy, she found herself moved by the mothers in the Old Testament. Mothers like Eve, Sarah, Hagar, Rebecca, Hannah, Rachel, Tamar, Bathsheba, Ruth, and many others, and took note of all the different experiences of pregnancy and parenting that she read. These women seemed like metaphors when she had previously read about them. She says the matriarchs were just that, mothers of nations and peoples, not mothers who live through months of actual embodied pregnancy, the same as my mother had experienced in order to give birth to me. But now, she says, now Sep can't help but imagine them with their growing bellies, their achy backs, their swollen ankles, feeling the stirring of tiny limbs within them as the fetuses gain strength. Sepp recognized that her way of reading the Bible during this time, where the text meaning comes from one's personal interactions with it, where a person can put themselves in the story as an active participant, it, it brings a richness to the reading that sometimes isn't there simply by reading through the Bible, when what turns out to many times be just reading words rather than having actual experiences that you could relate to. But Sepp added, I know how much the Bible already meant to me, even as a child. Great works of art can change their meaning for us across time. Books may remain static, but we don't. Referring to seeing ourselves in the text of the Bible, Sepp says, what is most miraculous and meaningful in our lives is often most universal, powerful because it has happened to so many others, now precious because it's happening to me. The principle of seeing ourselves in the biblical text is sometimes life-changing. There's a certain help that comes to us when we recognize that pages of the Bible are populated with people who are not unlike us people for whom life sometimes becomes too much long before that particular phrase was around. If you don't believe it, just read the book of Job. But this is not merely a case of misery loves company. There's also help in seeing what else the biblical writers had to say about their circumstances. For Elijah, it was being in God's presence hearing that still, small voice of God inquiring to him what was he doing and having the assurance that God was with him. We draw a measure of endurance from an understanding that not only do troubles come and go, but also our feelings about our life tend to change and tend to cycle through. Some days it all seems like too much, but other days with no change in circumstances, a person may feel less overwhelmed. The biblical book of Lamentations is also one of those hard time texts of the Bible, just as the name of the book suggests. 
but it describes the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians and all the suffering and agony that went with it. The book is traditionally attributed to Jeremiah, often called the weeping prophet. And listen to how Jeremiah describes his mood. He said, I'll never forget the trouble, the utter loneliness, the taste of ashes, the poison I've swallowed. I remember it all. Oh, how well I remember the feeling of hitting the bottom. And then comes his larger view or his comments on the larger view. He says, but there's one other thing I remember. And remembering, I keep a grip on hope. God's loyal love couldn't have run out. His merciful love couldn't have dried up. They're created new every morning. It would be easy to dismiss these biblical perspectives when a person is confronted by life that is simply too much. They sound a little too long range for the sunken present mood that many of us find ourselves in. We want solutions and we want relief now. But when we're in the pits, the scripture can speak to us in fresh new ways because a lot, of us, a lot of it is written literally in the pits of life. Stan Purdom tells of a young truck driver in a congregation he pastored who had a terminal diagnosis. Shortly before becoming sick, Joe had married, become a father, and purchased a semi-truck intending to become an owner-operator. But then came that ugly word, cancer. And he was eventually reduced to spending his days in bed, sometimes with his baby girl playing on the bed beside him as he awaited the end of his life. Stan visited him often, and on one of those visits, Joe mentioned that some scripture he had read that morning especially spoke to him and helped him. Stan asked what the text said, and Joe described it in his own words. But Stan couldn't quite place it. And Joe picked up his Bible and opened it to where he had a bookmark and showed it to Stan. It was 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 12, where the Apostle Paul talks about our lives as clay jars. And Paul says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested and made visible in our bodies. Now, seeing the passage, Stan realized that not only did he know that text, but he had just preached a sermon on that a few months earlier. He later thought about why it hadn't come to mind when Joe was speaking about it. And then Stan realized that for him, the passage was merely another sermon text. But for Joe, for Joe who was afflicted, perplexed, struck down, and feeling betrayed by his body, those verses were truth that reached him in his circumstances. In the words of the apostle, he found help and hope. What this calls for is a certain amount of perseverance. Weeding out the lows in the faith, hope, and feelings cycle. Believing that our outlook will change. Emotions can be like a a yo-yo or a roller coaster. God calls us to faith, which not only is believing without seeing, but sometimes is also believing without feeling. The reward of that kind of faith is that we remain at the right place. When the feelings return, we're still living in God's household, waiting for the silence in order to hear the still, small voice of God.
That's what we need to hang on to as we try to make it through the difficult days, the dark days of life. Amen. Your grace abounds in deepest waters, your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never My 
Come to the portion of our worship experience where we lift each other up and try to support each other and each other's burdens than whenever we go through these difficult times of life. The, I direct your attention to the prayer insert for this morning. And I commend to you those who are already listed on our prayer list. Does anybody have any other individuals? Um, add uh, to our prayer list this morning? Yes, Garrett. So Garrett's dad, Gary Smith, has COVID. Okay. Anybody else have any other concerns to share? If not, let us join together and lift up our prayers to God. Gracious God, when we feel compelled to push everything to its limits, especially you, Holy One, it's enough that your grace can slow us down when we need to be slowed down. When we stand naked and exposed to the buffeting winds of our doubts and our questions, it is enough, healing servant, that you clothe us in your peace and put our minds at ease. When we are entangled in that legion of worries and fears which consume our lives, it's enough, spirit of silence, that you untie the knots and set us free. We pray for those who, like Peter, are experiencing a crisis of faith, who long to wholeheartedly trust in God, but are held back by questions and doubts. We pray for those who, like the prophet Elijah, have fallen into despair, who have begun to doubt God's presence and power question God's call in their lives. We pray for those who, like Joseph, have had their hopes and dreams crushed, those whose lives have suddenly taken a different turn and who now wonder what lies ahead for them. We pray for those who, like Jesus' disciples, find themselves surrounded by high winds and stormy seas, those who feel overwhelmed by events and circumstances. Things like the loss of a job, or the death of a loved one, or serious accident or illness, or chronic pain, or depression, or divorce, but who don't know where to turn. Through the life-giving power of your Holy Spirit, make your sustaining presence known to all who are in pain or in need, so that they too may know your love and live. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our friend, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. God has richly provided all that we need for life's journey. What are we doing with God's bounty and God's gifts? How much of ourselves and the resources we command are we investing in the work God has called the church to do? May our dedicated dollars reflect a consecrated congregation.
as we bring our gifts to God's altar. Let us join together in our prayer of dedication. God of all times and places, may our offerings reflect confidence, not cowardice, altruism, not egotism, inclusiveness, not exclusiveness. We devote them to bringing all humanity into harmony with your purposes. May the programs we undertake build up the body of Christ among us and far beyond us. Amen. Shall we stand? Oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end. Remain forever near me, my Savior and my friend. I shall not fear thy struggle if you are by my side. God has come quickly to aid and instruct us. Now we depart to help others and to listen to them. God's family includes those living outside the church. With God, there is no outsider or insider. Daily, God asks, what are you doing here? Moment by moment, God is with us to help us. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Thanks be to God. And all God's people said, amen. amen.